is going to need a strong Conservative Party of Canada more than ever before. All right, so that was Stephen Harper tonight uh, in his speech in Vancouver. And also in the room, the two won the, uh, uh, the best trip of the week because they get to go to the West Coast in Vancouver. We have both Andrew Coyne and Chantelle Hebert. Uh, all right, so you had a chance to, uh, to witness the speech, to hear what he had to say, and what did you make of it, Andrew? Well, it was mostly a recitation of some of the Conservatives' greatest hits, you know, low taxes, balanced budgets, principled foreign policy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it was a uh, respectful and, and, I think, grateful audience. I don't think there was torrents of love there, but I think people recognized his achievements in bringing the two, erstwhile two Conservative parties together, in getting and holding on to power for several years, uh, and people certainly gave him props for that. Uh, and it's a surprisingly upbeat mood, actually, in this convention generally as, as you go into it, partly because here they are, they lost, but they weren't decimated. They're not hugely divided. Harper didn't hang on the way Diefenbaker did. Uh, so they have a real chance to rebuild here. And also, now that they're no longer in power, they have the freedom to do so and to be a more robustly conservative party than perhaps they were allowed to be while they were in power. Yeah, and uh, two points. There was nothing in that speech that sounds like doctrine that would tie the hands of someone who is running for the leadership. No one will be able to parse through it and say, ha ha, you want to take the party away from the Harper doctrine. So it avoids having Stephen Harper as a polarizing presence in the leadership campaign. The other point, there was a lot of French in that speech, more so than most speeches at the conservative convention. There was a long reference to the seats in Quebec and how Harper is proud of them. If I were a candidate that can't speak French as well as the guy on the stage tonight who's thinking of running, I would think twice because those seats and what he's proud of, which is rightly an asset to the party, you don't keep them with someone who can't speak the language of the people who vote in Quebec. Well, and he may well have been trying to tip his hand in that direction when, when he was speaking. Uh, he was introduced by Rana Ambrose, uh, who, who seemed to have, you know, she, she's trying to learn French, but she's got a ways to go, as, as do a lot of people. But uh, at the same time, he, you know, he seemed to go beyond just the normal in his talking about her, suggesting that she was one of the, you know, the best opposition leaders in the history of the country. Now, <laughs> was there yes, anything we, we should take from that? used to say that about someone else. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't have said so, no. I, I, that was, there was a lot of hyperbole in both of their speeches. Uh, I think you would expect no less than that he would heap praise on the interim party leader, as she's consistently referred to. Uh, there was a trial balloon a couple of weeks ago. There are people here at the convention uh, still trying to get, a, get the rules changed uh, to make her candidacy possible. I think there was a pretty forceful pushback on that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that people felt this would be dirty pool to, to change the rules uh, from what was the understanding when she took over as the interim leader. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about that this is a relatively unified party here. Uh, that might be one of those things that endangered some of the unity. I heard uh, in the hallways uh, today from the delegates I spoke to, no one was biting on that uh, in any significant way. The other thing is that the party needs to be the official opposition in the House of Commons for another full year. The last thing you want to do is to tear the, the team that is currently working apart and start from scratch because the interim leader, in a more or less consensual way, is suddenly running for leader. Uh, so I, I take that to mean, you know, we're, we're holding our own despite the fact that we're in a leadership campaign, and they are. And if she does have leadership ambitions, you know, if, let's say, they, they don't win the next election, and let's say that following past practice, the, the leader then steps, whoever it was, steps down, if she continues to do a good job and is seen as such as the, uh, as the interim leader, people might well say, well, you know, Ron Ambrose did such a good job, why don't we get her next? So she's, uh, she's not by any means cut out of a chance of becoming leader at some point. All right. Well, let me uh, go back to uh, one of the clips from Stephen Harper's speech because as they were looking at him, but he said he was looking at them, too, engaging that room. And here's what he said about what he saw. Watch this. Friends, as I look out on this great crowd tonight, I see the energy, I see the passion, and I see 
the deep abiding love for our Canada that will propel you forward to an even brighter future in the next election. It was this same energy that brought us together some 13 years ago in this, the modern Conservative Party of Canada. All right. Well, you know, as we've said, the, he's the only leader they've seen in this party since it, it was formed, the, the modern-day Conservative Party. Um, was that hyperbole, or is, is that what you're seeing in that room as well? Chantal? I'm, well, see I'm seeing a... Uh, um a more adult party that's uh, had the experience of power. Uh, that is, um, there are disagreements here. I'm not trying to say everyone believes the same things or will be defending the same positions, but they have fought battles together. They are more than just you know, some assembly of pieces. Uh, and they feel a lot more like a family, I have to say, than uh, they did when Stephen Harper became the leader. I mean, this is a party that has traditionally been the spare wheel of Canadian politics going back many decades. And it was interesting that Harper summoned up the history going back to Sir John A. He didn't say, you know, the, the history started in 2004, but, but connected it to those previous Conservative parties. But whereas those parties in defeat, as we mentioned earlier, either under Mulroney when the party spun apart into three sections, under Diefenbaker where it had that long war of attrition, uh, you know, it had not been a happy history. And it was always Stephen Harper's goal to make the Conservatives permanent contenders for power. Now, he bears some of this more than his share of the blame for the defeat, but I think he also can take some credit for the fact that this is a party that can now rebuild. It has not been obliterated. It has a, a legitimate shot at rebuilding and, and, and contending for power again. And whatever your partisan stripe, this country needs contestable politics. We need, in any given election, we need every party thinking they can win and every party thinking they can lose. Did it surprise? You're going to hear a lot this weekend about the... Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, did it surprise either one of you <laughs> that um, he didn't take a swipe in any way at those who defeated him? That he didn't go after the Liberals the way they've governed in the first six, seven months? Uh, he, he basically stayed away from talking about them at all. Did that, does that surprise you at all, Chantel? Uh, for two reasons. Uh, a, he wasn't auditioning to be the opposition leader, and it wasn't his place to do that. He is told others that he didn't want to interfere in domestic politics going forward, so this is a good place to start. But B, there are things that the Liberals are doing differently from the Conservatives that the Conservatives might sign off on on climate change and carbon pricing, for instance, there is no telling where the economy is going and where the deficit will be going. And you can go down the list. So up to a point, I think it was wise of him to not be fighting a battle on a battlefield that he's leaving tonight. You know, he was known as a very controlling, domineering leader when he was in power. But having left office, I, I must say he's been an exemplary, in my view, in terms of retiring from the scene. Uh, he's taken some criticism, even some mockery for being so low profile. But in, in my view, that's entirely appropriate. Once you're, you've left the stage, you've got to let other people take the, the spotlight. I'm told he was very reluctant even to come and speak to the convention here, but I think that was probably obligatory. But, uh, the, you know, at the core of Harper, whatever the complex mixture of things there, he does seem to be, doesn't need the adulation of politics. He's quite prepared, I think, to walk away from it and be his own man again. And that's uh, one of the more attractive sides of his personality. You know, we, we obviously are going to be focused for the next year on the leadership race. They are meeting in convention. Uh, there's always stuff going on in the hallways at convention. Are, are you seeing any evidence of the unfolding race there, Chantal? Oh, plenty, plenty of it. Well, first, the usual hospitality suites. But people who aren't running yet seem to be very eager to have hospitality suites that are well attended. Jason Kenney, not to name him. Uh, there are people around uh, who come and introduce themselves and say, I used to work for Peter McKay. Uh, I'm not sure that's terribly relevant to their CV, except that maybe Peter McKay will run. So, yes, there is a, a, a lot of buzz, but the, the, the convention itself is still looking at what that field will look like, and they don't have a feel for it yet. I mean, there's still a year to go until the vote. 
Uh, I think people are going to take their time in some cases before they jump in. We may see some late entrants. I mean, you're going to have probably quite a large field. It's very open. I don't think there's anybody who's sort of the, you know, the favorite really. Uh, and so that, you know, I think we could be surprised by some of the names that emerge uh, even beyond the names that we've heard already. Of course, the biggest surprise would be that the names we heard already are the only names we hear. <laughs> uh, that would be a bad surprise, I think, for most delegates here. Right. Well, a long way to go on that. Um, let me uh, let me ask you to this one because the two of you are, are uh, you know among the the top columnists and uh, opinion leaders in in the country with the, the the words that you express, and you've chosen Vancouver this weekend not just because it's a beautiful city, but you've chosen it covering the Conservatives over Winnipeg and covering the Liberals, the guys who won the election. Um, because uh, they're meeting in convention as well. So uh, explain the rationale behind Vancouver and not Winnipeg. Uh, well, let's start with Andrew Singh as Winnipeg is his hometown, and he ought to explain that one. Oh, <laughs> I apologize. I apologize to my hometown. Uh, look, it, this is a party that's, that's, that's rebuilding. That's of interest because uh, they have an opportunity in front of them, if you want to put it in a positive sense. They've got a chance now to really think through what it is they stand for, what they are as a party. You have the extra overlay, of course, of the leadership race. Uh, but there's all kinds of currents and cross currents going through the party right now as to people try to decide, you know, how, how do we make conservative policies relevant to, to in the current age to new issues and new demands? How do we reach out beyond uh, the traditional base of the party to, to groups that have traditionally not voted conservative? Uh, so there's lots of potential there. When you have a governing party, generally speaking, it's a pretty self-satisfied, uh, self-congratulatory uh, 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 mood. I understand there are some uh, controversies emerging at that level convention, but generally speaking, the action from a journalistic standpoint uh, is with the with the party in opposition. The liberal story in progress is the story of the liberals in government and not uh, at their convention. The story in progress here is happening on the floor of the convention where we happen to be. It's the better story, and that is why we are here. Well, you know, it's, it is going to be interesting to watch the, the weekend unfold. And once they get past this night, which is a, a kind of a goodbye and he disappears, um, some things may start to happen that are going to give us an indication. I mean, a lot of buzz around Kevin O'Leary, although I'm sure if he heard the former prime minister's remarks tonight so much in French, he's going to have to handle that question tomorrow when it comes up because he can't speak French, says he doesn't need to speak French. Um, but the buzz around that kind of stuff uh, could start up uh, w w with some action tomorrow. Yeah, and there's some interesting policy proposals to be debated, uh, and we'll get a, f a sense of how uh, how robust do they want their conservatives to be. There'll be a resolution, for example, on property rights. There'll be a resolution uh, around allowing foreign uh, uh, airlines to fly in Canada. There's some easy proposals, and there's some interesting uh, constitutional debates about the party's shape as well. Should they have a should there be a youth wing in the party that uh, that's traditionally looked askance at that kind of thing? Um, so you're going to start to see, I don't think you're going to see some huge thing erupt, but you're going to see the party starting to take shape, the party that will be post-Harper starting to take shape. Uh, uh, the beginning of a debate, I think, on uh, carbon pricing. The Ontario leader, a former member of Mr. Harper's caucus, uh, going uh, to be promoting the notion of endorsing a carbon tax for all those times in the House of Commons when MPs were asked to stand up and say the end of the world would come if we price carbon. That would be quite a change. So this debate will start here. It won't be resolved here, I don't think. All right. Listen, that's good. And, and thanks for dealing with the satellite delay that we have back and forth between Toronto and Vancouver. Uh, always fascinating and interesting dealing with that. Chantel and Andrew both in Vancouver uh, tonight and for the next couple of days.